Um, uh, first of all, I'd like everybody to uh, mute your phones because uh, we get a lot of background noise. We got over 100, we got 122 people uh, signed on this morning. So that's uh, that's good. We must have done something right. So got everybody uh, notified. Um, glad uh, you guys uh, are participating this morning. Um, it's important to, uh, we, uh, Tiffany uh, sent out uh, rosters. Uh, please fill those out so you get credit for being here. And if anybody has a question about whether or not you were trained or not, uh, you'll be able to prove it by, uh, uh, we can give you a copy of the roster. So um, if, you, if you don't have those, uh, you can uh, email Tiffany and she can uh, send you a copy of that. So everybody should have a copy of that uh, that uh, it was notified. Um, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank the, all our, uh, our uh, committee um, members um, that worked so hard on these, uh, these regulations, these, uh, these rules. Um, the uh, committee chairs uh, for the advisory committee are Kenny Murray and Sammy for uh, Cole and uh, Sammy Linville uh, for Metal Nine Metal. And I'll let uh, them introduce uh, their committees. And uh, Besides that, um, I think that uh, those are the major announcements right now. Again, uh, thanks for participating. And uh, Kenny, would you like to say a few words and introduce your, your team? Yeah, Jeff, I would. Thank you. Um, and first of all, thanks to everybody on this phone for their continued support of the nation's My Rescue Program area. You know, it's uh, it's an important piece of the, uh, the mining industry. Um, and... Um, Probably the uh, the one that doesn't get the most attention, thank God. Uh, but uh, um, we're glad you guys are still on board with us, and we appreciate your patience too as we develop these rules and coordinated the national contest. Uh, just as a reminder, the national contest won't be in Lexington. It's going to begin on Tuesday, August 9th, and it'll end with the banquet on Thursday, August 11th, and that's in the uh, newly renovated Rupp Arena. So. Uh, uh, we think you guys will uh, enjoy it and, and like it. It's uh, it looks like it was designed for a my rescue contest the way they have it set up. And uh, fortunately, we'll have a uh, the state of Kentucky is going to have their state contest in May in that same same arena. So it'll be like a live dry run. And uh, right beside me, I have the president of the KMI. I'll introduce him in a minute, Ronnie Biggerstaff. He's also the chairman of this committee, but. Uh, it's, it's a nice arena and I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. Um, you know, we're fortunate. We have all the uh, subcommittee members from the uh, Mine Rescue um, Rules Coal side uh, with us today on the line. Um, you know, these guys, I didn't add it up, but there are hundreds with a big S of years of my rescue experience at the table. So uh, we're fortunate to have these subject matter experts stay with us and, and dedicate their time. A um, couple of them, Ronnie, one of them, uh, and Wayne Davis are retired. But uh, their passion has been my rescue, and, uh, and they stuck with us. Uh, and we're, uh, we're fortunate to have that, uh, their, their expertise with us. Um, we think this is uh, the best training format for my rescue teams that we develop. Uh, as you'll see, you know, we unwound the unified rules just a little bit. We went back and uh, it's coal only and metal, non-metal only. That meeting will be at one o'clock today. If anybody wants to join in, you're welcome to, to listen in. Um, we do see value in bringing two sides together under one roof, but uh, we also see a value in split, splitting the uh, my rescue rules to our own disciplines to where we're most familiar with and get the best, uh, the best training value for uh, the time we spend with our team members. Um, as you'll see, as we go through the rules, there's no Q and A's. The previous Q and A's have been rolled into the actual rules document. Uh, so we're gonna start, our, our goal is to start each year without a Q and A, you know, to incorporate those previous year's Q and A documents into the actual rules. Um, if there's a need throughout the year for some type of an interpretation, we may have to develop one. Um, there should not be any local interpretations, rule interpretations for any of these local contests or local regions. Any any type uh, of uh, 
uh, need for an interpretation should be routed through this national committee that you're here today. Um, and on, in that same tone, the rules that you hear today, the 2022 rules, the expectations are that we use those for the national contest as well as any local contest in 2022. So if there's only one set of rules out there for, for our teams to compete under. Uh, that goes for coal and metal. Uh, but with that, I want to introduce the the the, uh, the committee that put these rules together from the mine rescue uh, subcommittee, and the chairman that is mentioned earlier is Ronnie Biggerstaff. Uh, we also have Kevin Vaughn, Lewis Mills, Wayne Davis, Gary Richardson, Will Altizer, and on the key officials from MSHA that's new to the group this year is Andy Wall. So, like I said, we're uh, we're happy and fortunate to have that group develop our rules and to give our guys the most uh, value in their 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 uh, my risky training experience. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to uh, to our chairman, Ronnie Biggerstaff. Okay, thanks, Kenny. Uh, this year, uh, now that the decision was made to go back to the regional coal rules, uh, we took the last approved coal rules of 2020 and added the Q&As, like Kenny said, back into them. And we only made a few changes, but mostly dealt with a lot of clarifications, you know, to deal with certain problem designs that we uh, had not addressed. And, uh, you know, most problem design situations, you know, they do a great job. You know, but we strongly encourage the problem design and to stay away from gray areas and questionable areas. And, you know, we had spent a lot of time dealing with a few of the scenarios in those questionable areas, you know, especially in the intersections. And we'll, we'll go over some of that today. Uh, you know, like he said, you know, with our rules committee, Wayne Davis, Lou Mills, and Kevin Vaughn, Will Altizer, and Gary Richardson, and myself, you know, we're going to run over the changes as well as some key areas such as, you know, gas extensions and exploration procedures, you know, that are affected by going back to the code rules. And, we want to kind of run back over some of that and refresh and, you know, with, you know, we've, we've discussed the rule and changes among the group and hopefully we'll cover any questions that may arise concerning them. And due to the contest season starting so shortly, you know, we won't be able to take any additional Q and A's on these, but hope to, to cover any of those changes so it is understood. So what we're going to do is we, we kind of broke this thing down and, uh, and uh, we'll start here with the general information and, uh, and I'll turn it over to Will uh, and that we'll take that portion. All right, Ronnie, thank you. I'm gonna start with the top part of the general information for conducting 2022 mine rescue contest. Uh, the first paragraph at the top on page one. Right there it is. Mine rescue rules were designed as a training tool for mine rescue teams. The gas levels, limits, travel distances, water levels, etc., were developed for contest purposes only. Discretion should be used in actual mine emergency situations. The mine rescue problem is utilized to comply with Part 49. The problem must be submitted and certified by the national contest directors. And then I'm going to go skip down to number five and cover it. Mine rescue team shall be notified by posting when they may review their map and scorecard. Within one hour of posting, the team captain, team trainer, briefing officer, or command center attendant, and map man shall report to a designated location. Teams will have 20 minutes to review and prepare any written protest. All protests will be considered by the final appeals committee. Under no circumstance will videotape recordings or photographs be introduced as supplementary material for consideration by the final appeals committee. Number six, for a combination team, the three working first aid team members will be chosen from the registered mine rescue team members. And this is something that was added on. For the final rankings of combination teams will be determined from a mine rescue team score and the first aid team score. When a team enters more than one first aid team, 
the first 18 members who will be associated with the mine rescue team for the combination award must be designated at the time the mine rescue team is registered. In case of an emergency, changes to the designated first aid team members may be made up to the mine, be made up to the time the team members report or lock up prior to the respective event. The changes will be submitted in writing to the chief judge of the event and or contest director and must be signed by a representative of the team and contest official. In the event of ties in the combination contest, the mine rescue rankings will be the tiebreaker. Now I'm going to go to the rules governing the 2022 mine rescue contest. Number one is at the top of page three. Who hey, will? Who are we going to be submitting those problems to? Uh, that's that's uh, what I was curious about. Uh, let me kind of chime in on that. That that's one thing I guess we never we kind of overlooked because we, I guess we were anticipating at some point that MSHA would take that, but evidently they're not. So uh, in that statement there about the uh, about submitting the problems to the national contest directors, we need to delete that. Uh, okay. Uh, Stephanie, you know, I guess it's kind of late in the game, but uh, could we go ahead and just delete that last uh, that sentence That's on the top of page one, the first paragraph. Yeah, we we had we didn't do anything with that kind of I guess assuming that what was going to happen, but I guess since we hurried and went going ahead and we're putting these rules in effect, we just need to to uh, uh, take the last sentence out where it says if a mine rescue problem is utilized to comply with forty nine, the problem will be submitted and certified. A national contest director. Okay. All right. So, so that, you know, until that they go back, we go back doing that, then we'll just leave that out. Okay. Go ahead, Will. I'm sorry. All right, Stephanie, I'm at the top of page three. The rules govern the 2022 Mine Rescue Contest. <clears throat> there you go. Thank you. I'm going to cover the uh, number one. Each team shall be composed of a minimum of seven persons, five working team members, a briefing officer, and or command center attendant and patient, and shall be limited to a maximum of 10 persons. When teams elect to use a sound, when teams elect to use a sound powered telephone communication system or lifeline, Teams may provide up to two persons to assist in the managing of the lifeline. If provided, these two persons must be in lockup and part of the 10 member team. The two lifeline persons will not be selected for taking the written examination. Teams will be responsible for managing lifeline behind the contest lifeline judge. That's just a review. Uh, then down to the, uh, we'll start at the second paragraph or the third paragraph. Each team shall have a briefing officer and or command center attendant, which will accompany only one participating team. Switching of team members, including briefing officer and or command center attendant from one team to another is prohibited. The command center attendant will be isolated for visual contact with the field and will be stationed at the command center during the working of the problem and will maintain voice communications with the team using either a portable hardwire communication system or a wireless radio system. The command center attendant may advise the briefing officer and interact with the team. The briefing officer and or command center attendant map may be marked with information received from the team while the team is in by the fresh air base. However, the team, the briefing officer and the command center attendant will not be allowed to visually compare their maps once the team leaves the fresh air base to begin expiration. No side-by-side -side comparison will be allowed. All maps shall be turned in at the completion of the problem. However, only the map designated by the team shall be used for scoring purposes. The team will designate the map to use by checking the box in the lower right-hand corner. 
If neither map is identified by the team for scoring, the briefing officer map will be scored unless the only map completed was the command center attendant map. To kind of chime in there, uh, Will, excuse me for a minute. One thing we're doing this year is we're putting the briefing officer back in the fresh air base like we used to go. And uh, so, uh, you know, therefore, and you, as we go through the rules, you'll see how we put it back in to where you have to, uh, his designated area will be, uh, uh, you still have to ventilate, uh, keep it well ventilated and, and, uh, and you can't move him, you know, for, uh, uh, ventilation purposes is wherever his station is, it has to maintain the respirable atmosphere. So we're just putting the briefing officer back in the fresh air base, uh, like we used to. So when you see that, you'll, you know, the rest of these rules, you'll know where we're going there. And go ahead, Will. I'm sorry. All right. All right. The briefing officer will remain at a designated location in the fresh air base when the team is working in by the fresh air base, except when it is necessary to perform work outside the location in the fresh air base. When work is completed, the briefing officer must return to the designated location. Each team shall provide its own breathing apparatus for each member of the team. A breathing apparatus approved for at least four hours shall be used in mine rescue contest problems. Other approved breathing apparatuses may be used on patients. Each team member must wear safety boots, an approved MSHA protective hat and cap light, and members must be similarly dressed. Some team members wearing long sleeves or long pants, while others wear short sleeves or short pants will be considered similarly dressed as long as they are of the same style and color. That last part was added in, that was part of the Q and A. During the working of the problem, the cap light may be, during, during the working of the problem, the cap, cap lights may or may not be turned on, but must be operational. The wearing of self-rescuers is not required for contest work. Each team member must have a metal identification tag attached to his or her belt. Each team must have at least one stretcher capable of transporting an unconscious person. And each team must have at least one portable fire extinguisher rated at 2A 10 BC with a minimum five pound capacity. Fire extinguishers can be used more than once if multiple fires are encountered during the problem. And that's all I had to cover on that. I'm gonna skip over to the number seven on the top of page seven. And just gonna cover that and then we'll go to the written examination. See, each team member must be under guard in a designated location before the start of the contest. Teams must remain continuously under guard until time to work the problem. Teams that have completed will not be permitted to return to the isolation area or communicate with any team members awaiting their turn to compete. Now I'm gonna go down to written examinations, number one and cover it, for it has changed. All right, written examination. During isolation, contest officials will administer a written examination to the five working team members and the briefing officer of each team. The five lowest test scores will be used for, for the cumulative team score. The written examination will be 10 statements of fact taken verbatim from the contest rule. Each statement will contain a blank space which shall represent a keyword with no more than two consecutive blanks per statement. Answers will be multiple choice with three choices. Answers will not be intentionally misspelled. None of the above shall not be used as one of the three choices. Uh, we'll read that again uh, and use the version that she's got there on the, on the board. I think the the other uh, drag thing had, had that worded maybe a little different because we changed that a little bit. So look at right. the way she's got that one again. Read that, read that again on I'll do uh, it. number one there. Thank you. During isolation, contest officials will administer a written examination to the five working team members and the briefing officer of each team. 
the five individual test scores with the least amount of discounts will be used to determine the cumulative team score. So we'll take the lowest five scores. The written examination will be 10 statements of fact taken verbatim from the contest rules. Each statement shall contain a blank space which shall represent a key word with no more than two consecutive blanks per statement. Answers will be multiple choice with three choices. Answers will not be intentionally misspelled and none of the above shall be used as one of the three choices. And a maximum of 15 minutes will be allowed for the team members to take the test. Team members taking the written examination will not be permitted to take any written material and in, or information into the testing area. There will be no discussion during the time that written examinations are being taken. No wireless communication or electronic devices, including Apple watches or similar devices will be permitted in the testing area. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Will. Uh, uh, now, Gary Richardson will start uh, with the A card and, and uh, Gary, if you would, there, go ahead. Thanks. Interpretation of A card. Be on page. Start with Gary, that. could you speak up a little bit? It's kind of hard to hear you there. Turn it up. Yeah. That better. Uh, no, not really. <clears throat> Still pretty low there. Yeah. Turned up as high as it'll go. Okay. Yeah, just speak loud there. <laughs> Thank you. Interpretation of A card. We'll start on the page eleven, number five. Reads failure to locate and record accurately verbatim on the team map objects and conditions that should have been found and were indicated to be on the mine for each emission. And if you look down below B in the red, we've added the exception would be the objects that may be in the fresh air base located in conditions that could not be explored by the previous team, such as water over knee deep, caved areas or unsupported, unsafe roof across the fresh air base that would not be considered explored by paragraph D of this rule. Can you hear me better, Ronnie? Yeah, you sound good now. Okay. On page 12, F. It says the mark map as submitted by the team will be compared with the problem and key map by the map examiners. Objects and conditions located on the map must be within six foot of accuracy and six foot allowance will be measured from the center point of the object slash condition drawn into the center point of the object slash condition denoted on the key map. All ob objects and conditions mapped on the team must be shown in entries, cross cuts, and openings. If a team fails to explore the entire mine, the furthest point of advance shall be indicated on the map submitted to the map examiners except at locations where the following objects slash conditions are encountered. Faces, caved areas, water over knee deep, unsafe roof across an opening, seals, and we've added permanent or temporary stoppings, barricades, inextinguishable fires. Objects and conditions must be indicated on the team's map submitted to the map examiners. This does not include statements read by the patient or notes given to the team. If you scroll down to K. So it's a placard indicating a person that is located by the team in an area of elongated or what we've added diagonal unsafe roof but cannot be reached due to the lack of roof support shall be marked as an X on with the word person written out. 
if the team the sorry, reaches the person placard and the placard is changed to a body or live persons the proper symbol shall be used in conjunction with the original x on l you can see we've added also the permanent or temporary stoppings also on that the opening and closed of the doors if you scroll down just a little bit further if the team clears a gas or smoke from part of the intersection, denote cleared with a line to the area that has been cleared. And uh, we made a comment to just use a not just a straight line. Don't put an arrow. If you scroll down to uh, N, you'll see we've uh, added such permanent, such as permanent and temporary stoppings to the stoppings. Um, we. We mentioned this of adding of permanent and temporary mainly for the problem designers that all stoppings need to be identified as permanent or uh, temporary for the problems themselves. If you go down on page 14, number seven. It says each team may have a command center attendant who will who will accompany only one team and remain in lockup with that team. The command center attendant will be full time employee of the company companies that mine rescue teams represent and may not be one of the team members referred to in rule one governing the 2022 mine rescue contest. The attendant will use the computer located in the designated command center locations with the briefing officer. Each team shall have a briefing officer and a command center attendant. The briefing officer and command center attendant will be located in the command center together. When both positions are used, the command center map must be an electronic map. If only the briefing officer is in the command center, he can use either electronic or manual mapping. The map of the attendant will be graded for scoring purposes. If designated by the team. If the briefing officer's map is used for scoring purposes and there is a discount on the briefing officer's map, the attendance map will be reviewed. If the discount is correct on the attendance map and no discount will be assessed on the briefing officer's map. The same removal of discount will apply if attendance map is scored and discount is correct on the briefing officer's map. We've added the removal of discounts when both briefing officer and CCA map are utilized will be limited to six discounts. Hey, Gary. Yes. Uh, the briefing officer needs to be removed up there where briefing officer and command center attendant will be located in the command center together. Uh, yeah, we, it's wrong. <clears throat> We're looking at that here too. Uh, that's something we overlooked, you know, where we changed that briefing officer. We thought we had it covered and everything, but that, uh, uh, let's see. Let's look at the, their own seven. Go back to the previous page, their own bottom of page 14. Where it says each team shall have a briefing officer and command center attendant. Uh, we need to strike out the part where it says the briefing officer, you know, going into the next page, the briefing officer and command center attendant will be located in the command center together. Uh, uh, we need to strike that sentence. That's, that should cover it, shouldn't it, Wayne? I don't lose here with me looking at it. We, that's just something we... Yeah, that'll take care of it, Ron. Okay, all right. Okay, that, that, that should take care of it there. Okay. All right, thanks, Gary. And uh, looking on now, we'll get into the B card, and uh, Lou will, will start off with it.
Okay, on the big fire, can everybody hear me okay? Assume you can. Um, there's not a lot of changes to start with. Um, so we'll skip over to, uh, it's really on page 17, but I'll start on uh, 16. Failure to make proper apparatus sanitization during required apparatus checks, each infraction, one discount, maximum five. Uh, the each team captain will examine gauges and apparatus of each team members of team members and have his gauge and apparatus examined by the team member. A proper examination, proper apparatus examination will include a verbalization that the person performing the apparatus examination is checking the gauge face piece, hoses, and determine by sight or feel that the protective cover is secure. If the gauge has, has a protective holder, the gauge must be put back into the holder after viewing. Uh, we had a question on the Q&A concerning what's involved in examining, uh, particularly the gauge, and there was some <clears throat> um, Discussion about, you know, how, how, what does the captain actually have to do? Well, just to alleviate the, the judgment calls there, he just has to verbalize that he is checking the gauge, face piece, hoses, and determine by sight and feel uh, that the protective cover is secure. So that kind of takes the uh, judgment call out of it. Yeah, I mean, a problem designer could put in there that the uh, uh, the captain must report the lowest reading at each team check, or you know, but that'd be a problem designer. That'd be a written uh, written instructions kind of thing. So, but it uh, just under normal circumstances, he just has to verbalize that he's checking those things, and then and the person checking him has to verbalize it back. Let's go. Um, Really, we need to skip all the way over to rule number 24, starting on page 23. Failure to make the necessary gas tests were required. Each location, five discounts. Uh, A, if uh, conditions permit, permit tests for methane, carbon monoxide, and oxygen efficiency, shall be made at each team stop that is required by the problem or during initial exploration in unexplored areas and at the following normal required areas to be tested. All mine entrances, entrances to the section of the mine to be explored, faces, walls of overcast or undercast, stoppings, barricades, and seals, and in parentheses there it says, if intact and airtight. There were some questions about, uh, does that just mean the seals in seals that are intact and airtight? No, if you'll notice, there's a list there. After faces, there's a semicolon. And then walls of overcast or undercast, comma, stoppings, comma, barricades, comma, and seals. So all of those things will require a gas test at them if they're intact and they're tight. If not, if the wall of overcast has a door in it that's open, or if it's damaged, it, or if a stopping is has a hole in it, uh, if a barricade's you know, not intact, and if a seal's not intact, then there's not a gas test required at it. But if they're intact, so that list is what is included in the intact and they're tight. Um, moving right along, all fires, sample pipes or tubes in airtight seals, valves must be open before testing. If closed, open boreholes, exhaust fans, and objects conditions that prohibit further travel in that direction, including cut into old works. And we had 
some questions on the Q and A about is that the only thing cutting it all works? No, it's not. There was there's always been et cetera there, but we just put a few more examples in there. Uh, cutting the old mines, cutting the into abandoned mines, and etc. So um, any of that verbiage that says you're cut into something will require a gas test at that location. Uh, the last sentence there on A is gas tests made during apparatus checks are not normal areas to be tested. Um, If you if you you know just and I know you all know this, but methane, carbon dioxide, and oxygen fish seal will be the only tests that we have in the coal uh, rules. Um, let's, let's jump over to E on page twenty five. When smoke is encountered, it will be considered to extend to a placard stating the end of smoke or the separation intended or in indicated to be airtight. So the difference between gases and smoke is the smoke will continue until there's an end of smoke or an airtight separation, whereas a gas extends to the next normal or area to be tested. And that's that's the way they always has been in coal. Uh, so that's really not a change. I uh, just wanted to, to bring that out that uh, uh, smoke is different than than the test for methane, carbon monoxide, and oxygen deficiency. Let's jump over to, to rule number 29. Uh, any team member traveling more than 25 feet from the captain or the number five team member's original stopping point needs infraction to point discount. Um, Lou, hey Lou, let me interrupt you just a second. Okay. If you don't care, go over to the extent of gas figure four and go through that figure with everybody. Just explain the extension of gas. Yeah, I was Before going. You yeah, let's do that. So on page 47, Stephanie. Roll down to the very bottom there so we can see the, the bottom of the, the figure, Stephanie. Okay, uh, we'll start in number one there. Um, there's a gas placard at the mouth of, of number one. That gas will extend up to uh, the unsafe roof. And since there's another placard at the unsafe roof, uh, it would extend into the unsafe roof. Now these placards, the unsafe roof placard and the gas placard need to be side by side. Uh, we've had some controversy on that in the past. The way to clear that up, if you're a problem designer, if you're laying out the field, if you want that gas to be in that, unsafe roof, you need to put those placards side by side. And that way the teams, uh, there's really no reason why teams should be guessing where gases are. They, you know, we, we've got uh, continuous readout uh, instruments that, that tell us where gases are at all times. So uh, teams shouldn't have to guess where, where gases are. So uh, if you want that gas in there, those two placards should be side by side. Let's jump over to number two entry. It's just another example of where it would not be in there uh, because the gas test is required at that unsafe roof. So we've got a gas placard at the mouth there. That gas would extend up to the next normal area to be tested. The next normal area to be tested is a, a condition that stops your travel in that direction. So another gas test is required at that condition or really a gas test is required at that condition so uh, if there's no placard there then it would not be in the unsafe roof uh, let's jump over to uh, 
to the number three entry. When the team enters up number three into that intersection, they find a gas placard against an area of, looks like it's a caved area, but the placard is right against the caved area. Uh, again, the problem designer should put the caved placard and the, uh, the uh, gas placard side by side. Now, in this case, the gas would back up and be in the entire intersection. As well as go into the caved area. So um, now, if we probably have an, another example up here of that, we do. So I'll get to that a little later. So let's jump back over to number one entry up in by the uh, second cross cut. Uh, there's a there's a gas placard going up toward a diagonal unsafe roof. A uh, gas that unsafe roof stops your travel in that direction, so a gas test is required at that unsafe roof. So that gas would stop at that gas placard. Again, unless uh, unless the problem designer puts down another placard, it would not be in the unsafe roof. The second intersection in number two entry, we got a couple of scenarios there. If you notice when you enter that intersection, there's a gas placard in that intersection. There's a cave, diagonal cave area across, but the but it is intended that the gas placard is not against the cave. In other words, the two placards are not side by side. So it would not be in the cave. Because uh, there's another gas test required at the cave. And uh, so uh, it, the gas would not extend into the cave. Now let's jump across into the cross cut between number two and three there. And it's basically the same scenario. Uh, the team comes through the cross cut from number three toward number two. They find a gas placard going over into the intersection. It would extend into the intersection, but there's a gas test required at the cave in the intersection, which would stop that gas. So it would not be in the cave. Okay, going up number three, uh, just a simple, uh, the team finds a gas placard in the center of the intersection it would be in the entire intersection. Uh, we'll just go on up number three. Uh, at the beginning of the intersection there, a team finds a gas placard, but in the center of the intersection, they find an open borehole, which requires a gas test, would stop the gas halfway through the intersection. Okay, and the only other one we haven't discussed is uh, the one in number two in the one, two, three, in by the third cross cut. Team finds a gas in the entry. It would extend into the next intersection. And since there's a gas test required in all three of those openings, and there's no extension, uh, you know, the rule says, uh, you know, uh, that the gas would be determined by the by placard if, if, if they want to extend the gas and there's no placards there that would indicate that the gas extend past the intersection. So it would just be in the intersection. It would stop in the, at the planes of the intersection. That cover. Kenny, this is, Kenny, this is Barry Baker. Could you, could you clarify uh, putting a uh, overcast in the intersection and coming into the walls of the overcast being open and versus closed, where the gas uh, extent is going to go and where the placards need to be placed. Yeah, that gets back. Let's see, that gets us back to what we talked about before on, on Rule 24, where it says if um, if you're coming through a cross cut and you and, and you find a gas and the wall of the and then you go a little further and you find the wall of an overcast. 
if the wall of that overcast is intact and airtight, it, it, a gas test is required at that wall of overcast. That gas test would stop the gas if, if that, if the wall of the overcast is intact and airtight. Uh, if the problem designer would want that gas to go over the overcast, he would have to put another placard at that where that gas test is required. The other scenario is if there's a door in the overcast or if the, if the overcast is not intact, then there's no gas test required at that wall and the gas would extend under the overcast and over top because no gas test is required that would stop that gas. That would be if it's damaged. Yeah, that, that clarifies it well. I appreciate that. So it's all about where gas, you know, if a gas test is required. That's why I hit on that uh, little list of stuff there where a gas test is required and it all based on whether it's intact and airtight. Okay, um, back to rule 29. Uh, the third paragraph, I think, uh, before advancing into an unexplored intersection, this team will be required to explore all accessible areas at each team stop up to the machinery line of the next intersection or at an object or condition that prohibits further travel in that direction. And it says C figure five. This includes initial exploration into all entries from the fresh air base surface, bottom of shafts. When the captain enters the intersection, the intersection will be considered explored unless there are object conditions that prohibit the captain from seeing the entire intersection, such as caved areas, water over knee deep, or an intact diagonal ventilation structure slash barricade. Uh, that was, a, uh, we had a couple of questions in the Q&A about that, and, and that kind of answers it. No. Uh, the, the, even in the intersection, the captain still not, cannot see into uh, a cave or water over knee deep or can't see through a, through a curtain that's intact. So you're not responsible for anything that's, that's in, in there that the captain can't see. Thanks, Lou. Uh, let's see, start with rule 30, uh, ask Kevin Vaughn to get on there. Kevin. Okay, thank, thank you, Ronnie. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, rule 30, the first paragraph, uh, captain or other team member who acts to endanger self, briefing officer or patient, five points each team member or patient, each infraction maximum 15 points each occurrence. Uh, five except part F and the, the change was the briefing officer was added to that paragraph since the, uh, because he had been moved back uh, into a position. He could be in danger back into the fresh air base. Okay. We'll go on to going to page uh, 31 uh, rule 30. <coughs> F. And the second paragraph in 30F, uh, <clears throat> when a body is located in an area of elongated or diagonal unsafe roof and the team finds and maps the body, the location of the body be, will be considered known. This will apply even if there are conditions that prevent the captain from physically examining the body. And just the words uh, or diagonal uh, was added because we, we understand what elongated unsafe roof is along a pillar. Uh, this just includes, uh, it could happen in an intersection where you have a diagonal that you do uh, travel perpendicular to a body and can see it, but may not be able to get into it at that time. But it will, it would be known, considered known. Okay. Uh, number H. On H, ventilating irrespirable atmosphere over the briefing officer's designated location. The atmosphere for the briefing officer shall remain respirable. This cannot be achieved by the use of an apparatus or SCSR. The briefing officer cannot be relocated at the fresh air base to allow irrespirable air to flow across his designated location. 
and again, that's that's language added back in because of uh, that the briefing officer has been moved back into the fresh air base. Again, he is in the fresh air base. He is in a position that he could possibly be uh, endangered. Okay, uh, rule 31 uh, is talking about uh, an ex uh, explosion. So go into paragraph B, uh, continuing expiration after conditions are found to indicate an imminent explosion is possible by the presence of an explosive mixture and evidence of fire, visual, visual acknowledgement of a fire, smoke, or carbon monoxide above 10 ppm, or continuing expiration when energized electrical equipment Energized circuits, including all batteries except cap light batteries, or energized cables are found in an explosive mixture. And the, the addition is teams will be discounted under this rule if they continue to explore, breaking the imaginary lines of the intersection, if a withdrawal situation is found in the intersection. However, teams will be required to map all objects and conditions in the intersection that can be seen, Rule 29, fourth paragraph. <clears throat> and this kind of goes back to the last the last change that Lou was talking about. So when the captain steps one step in, into an intersection uh, for, you know, for the rules, uh, the entire intersection is considered to be explored and everything that you would expect that could be seen can be seen so it's with one step in. So, um, as soon as he steps in and maybe you have a withdrawal situation, maybe you're traveling in gas and you walk into an intersection and halfway through the intersection, uh, there's a, a, a battery mine phone. So you have a quitter, but because, uh, as soon as you enter the intersection, the whole intersection is considered to be explored. You can go anywhere in that intersection, as long as you don't break the imaginary lines before you leave. And that would include, possibly passing that uh, ignition source because you've already considered to be explored in that intersection. However, if the captain, which would be, uh, might happen, it comes up to, to a, an object and does stop, say a battery mine phone, and there's another object past that, it would still have to be mapped because you can still see it. It's been, it, it has been seen as soon as the captain enters that intersection. But as long as he, uh, doesn't break any of the lines, he won't break any rules about continuing to explore uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quitter because that intersection is immediately explored once you enter it. I've got a question on that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, according to that rule, just assume that you had that situation where you had an explosive mixture. In by the scoop, you had somebody under uh, a wraparound uh, unsafe roof. You had the timbers to get him. I know you're allowed to go get him, but if you don't go get him, will you be docked? <laughs> yeah, so you'd have to timber in to get him in by that situation. Yeah, and you know, way the rules written, you can you can do that. But my only question is, if somebody just says, you know, they map it, but they don't go get him, they FPA and they leave, or they go get docked for not getting that individual. I, yeah, I, I believe. Tell me if I'm wrong, uh, Ronnie, but I believe you can do that. You can do anything within that team stop, as long as you don't continue to explore. If he's yeah, in the I know you can do anything in it. What I'm saying is, if you don't, will you be docked for not getting that individual? I'm sure. If you've got timbers. Yeah. 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 Because you can, because you can see him. Yeah, you, you can see him. And, you know, if you put somebody in an intersection, you have to give them the timbers. My only question yeah. was, if you don't go get him, will a team be docked for not going to get him? I understand that they can get him. I, I, my question was just, if they don't get him, do you dock them? I believe you do if you don't have the means to, if, if you do have the means to do it. Okay. Thank you. Everybody agree, Wayne, Lou? Yeah, I do. Okay. Designers can draw up all kinds of scenarios. Question. We would ask that prop designers not, not toy with that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, it's just, when I mean, you can have all kinds of scenarios with, with, uh, what you can and can't do, and, and 
you know, is don't, you know, what we're really saying is don't let something like that decide a contest. You know, that's what I was talking about earlier is flirting around with the gray areas. It's just, you know, if, uh, you know, and, and we, we kick this around on these intersections <laughs> of, of these kind of situations, you know, putting like TPs and unsafe roof and sticking guys in them and zigzagging. And that's really why we got to, to the point of where we said, you can do whatever you can at that intersection because we didn't want a team on a judgment call saying he took one step past it, you know, so we allowed, is it okay to make it safe of completing your zigzag in the intersection or take one step past now you docked him and you don't want stuff like that to decide a contest. And all we're saying is keep it in the, keep it in the, the lines and, and don't try to throw teams and, and flip it out, you know, they're in the, in those kind of screwed up situations. And that's all we ask you to do, you know. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay, yeah, this this is the only thing, only situation where a withdrawal uh, situation exists that you might actually pass the ignition source or the gas placard is within an intersection as long as you don't break any of the imaginary lines. Okay, all right. Rule 32, uh, failure to locate missing persons, each emission 10 um, under the second paragraph, uh, if the captain cannot physically examine a missing person, missing person located under an elongated or diagonal unsafe roof due to a lack of roof support, a team stop will not be required. If the team has roof supports, timbers, with them, then the captain must timber to the person and examine it before passing it. So if the team comes upon a missing person under uh, uns. uns elongated or diagonal unsafe roof and has the timbers with them, the captain cannot pass it until it's each timber in and checked out. Okay, next paragraph. If roof support is provided, bodies under unsafe roof must be examined before the clock is stopped and after all missing persons have been accounted for, see figure three. The emphasis is that bodies will not be timbered to until all missing persons have been found. Teams should not be discounted if a body is encountered while timbering through an area of unsafe roof in order to ventilate through the unsafe roof. If all missing persons are not found, teams will not be required to timber to bodies. All right. Uh, we'll move down to rule 35, failure to remove irrespiral atmosphere. I'll just read that whole thing. If an irrespirable atmosphere is encountered immediately out by an airtight barricade, the team must remove the irrespirable atmosphere before breaching the barricade. If an irrespirable atmosphere is encountered immediately out by an airtight ventilation structure and verbal contact is made with the patient, the team must remove the irrespirable atmosphere before breaching the structure. And the addition says, the exception is if both sides of the airtight barricade or airtight ventilation structure have been made or explored and removing the barricade or airtight ventilation structure would not violate other rules, it would not be necessary to remove the ir irrespirable atmosphere before breaching the structure. So if you have a, a, an airtight stopping or barricade that you've made both sides of and there's some <coughs> irrespirable, uh, you would not have to ventilate it uh, to remove it. Okay, we'll go to rule 36 um, at, on refuge alternatives. And, you know, if you, we, we don't talk about refuge alternatives a lot, so I'm just, bear with me. I'm going to read through this whole thing, and then we'll get to the, to the addition. Uh, we'll start at the top on page 34. When a team finds a refuge alternative, the team must enter the refuge alternative at the same team spot by the following method. Whether the atmosphere outside is respirable or irrespirable, the captain must open the outer door and take a gas check in the airlock prior to any team member entering the airlock. The team, two members, the captain and, and another team member, may enter into the airlock, close the outer door, and close the outer door. If the air inside the airlock is respirable, the team may open the inner door and the captain must take another guest test prior to any team member entering the area. 
If the atmosphere inside the airlock is irrespirable, the team will use the purge valve placard for five seconds to clear the airlock. The captain will then take a gas test to determine that the irrespirable atmosphere is cleared. The captain will then open the inner door and take a gas test prior to enter any team member entering that area. If the atmosphere outside the refuge alternative is irrespirable, the patient must be protected with an approved breathing apparatus before being removed from the refuge alternative. Team members entering the airlock may drop their lifeline at the refuge alternative door, even in smoke, so that an airtight airlock is maintained and allow them to move around in refuge alternative. If smoke is present outside the refuge alternative, once the patient is removed, placed on the stretcher if unconscious, team members must immediately reattach themselves to the lifeline. Objects other than the person or bodies inside the refuge alternative will not need to be mapped. Orientation of person or bodies will not need to be mapped as they are found because of limited space of the enclosed refuge alternative. If the live person is unconscious and they, they may be moved outside the refuge alternative before being placed on a stretcher. And this is the addition. If a team must leave this team stop prior to entering the refuge alternative to return to fresh air base, for example, an apparatus failure to take other patients out, et cetera. The team must return to this team stop and enter the refuge alternative uh, uh, prior to advancing to the next intersection slash team stop, see rule 29, fourth paragraph. And that's just uh, talks about making all accessible areas before moving to unexplored areas. And, and a refuge uh, is, is considered an accessible area. Okay, we'll move to rule 39, page 35. The assistance lent, lent by supposedly an unconscious patient. Uh, examples such as patient sitting up unassisted or moving arms so as to help them putting on apparatus or unconscious patient communicating with the team. Uh, once any patient is brought to the fresh air base, he or she This addition in loading the stretcher. So the the patient, uh, you know, if he's brought out brought out walking or brought out on the stretcher, he can get off, and he can he can take his apparatus off and set it on the ground. But that's it. That's all he can do. I guess if you tried to set it back on the stretcher, that would be considered loading. So he just needs to take, take it off. You know, another thing to stress on is he take it off and then cut cut the machine off and set it on the ground. Yeah, yeah he can turn it off. Yeah. If I hand it to somebody, just he just can't put it on the stretcher and start loading the stretcher up and all that. And uh, yeah, so and that's a big thing for the judges to be uh, to notice too is don't allow it to happen on. Or one, you know, like sometimes I've seen where a patient can I, can I put it back on the stretcher and the judge say, yeah, but it's not fair. It, it's in the rules that all he can do is shut it off, take it off, and then set it on the ground or, or hand it to somebody, not not start reloading me around. Uh, hey, Ronnie, that okay. looks like everything up to 44. Do you want to change? Uh, You'll see. Uh, I was going to, yeah, <clears throat> I'll let uh, Wayne, uh, Wayne Davis take over and uh, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. All right, Stephanie, scroll over to page 37, rule 44. <clears throat> Fair to explore or examine working systematically and thoroughly each emission four. Uh, we added uh, to inaccessible to all areas of the mines where the team travel was blocked by one or more of the following conditions, seals, unsafe roof, rib to rib, inextinguishable fires, water over knee deep, caved areas, and cut into old works. Other terms such as not bolted or unsupported top, etc., top working, so forth, should not be used. Only the conditions used in the legend. And this was one of the Q's and A's. Uh, some of the problem designers were uh, adding like top working, uh, what stops a team. Uh, you need to use terms in the legend uh, if you want the team to stop. 
Can you hear me good, Ron? Yeah, I hear you good, Ron. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, if you'd scroll over to our next change, will be on page 40, the rule 45. <clears throat> okay, you're, you're good. It'll be the actually the top of 40. You got it. Okay, and it's only the ventilation material provided will be permitted to be used during the working of the problem. And uh, I'll just read the first part of that before we put, put the uh, red part, red line in there. Erected walls of overcast, undercast cannot be removed or altered by the team. An overcast can not be rebuilt as an overcast if completely destroyed, but if the materials from the completely destroyed overcast are on the field, they can be used to build a temporary stopping. Okay, scroll down a little bit, Stephanie. Okay, if the problem design requires a seal to be breached, or if the seal is found that is not airtight, the materials from the seal can be completely dismantled and used to build a temporary stopping. So that's the same as an overcast. If you find it not airtight and the materials is actually on the field, you can use it to build a temporary stopping. 48D. <clears throat> okay, Steph, there you go. D, ventilation structures built by the team may only be placed perpendicularly across an entry, cross cutter opening, or diagonally from safe corner to safe corner at an intersection. A safe corner is one without water over knee deep, unsafe roof, unsafe rib, or caved areas touching it. If the water over knee deep is pumped or the unsafe roof is supported, the corner can be used for building ventilation structures. So this clarified, I guess, probably to 2018 where you couldn't use that corner no matter if you did uh, support the roof, pump the water. Now you can if uh, you pump the water or support the roof. Okay, scroll on down, Stephanie. Don't care on E. <clears throat> okay, all righty. Uh, e, team members holding up a bradish cloth in an attempt to clear a contaminant shall be discounted under ru this rule and the contaminant shall not be cleared. Line curtain is designated curtain provided for teams to hold up in order to remove a contaminant from an airtight separation to a safe corner of the nearest intersection. A safe corner is one without water over knee deep, unsafe roof, unsafe rib, or caved areas touching it. If the water over knee deep is pumped or the unsafe roof is supported, the corner can be used for holding up the line curtain. Teams that encounter a previously installed line curtain can remove it and use it at other locations. Line curtains cannot be used in an intersection with an intact overcast. And with that, Stephanie, let's scroll over. We look like we have a little bit of time to figure 2B at page 45. <clears throat> okay, this is just examples of proper method of setting roof supports through unsafe roof. Stephanie, if you'll go down to the bottom of that sketch, Okay, right there. Is there any way you can enlarge that just a little bit? Okay, let's let's go into the number one entry and then we'll work our work our way across. If you had a triangle unsafe roof in an intersection as shown in one and you was wanting to timber through there to go advance on 
if you come off the safe rib five foot out by the unsafe roof, then set your, your timber in the unsafe roof five foot off the corner and five foot, no more than five foot in by the first timber you set. And then you step out of the unsafe roof and set the other timber five foot from the safe corner and not five and no more than five foot away from the one you set in the unsafe roof. You could travel, use a rib line, you could travel through there. Step over into number two, the first intersection in by. It shows the intersection, total inter intersection unsafe. And to travel through the middle of the intersection, the unsafe roof, you'd have to do, of course, your roof test out by if you're approaching it from the out by area. You set your two post in good roof out by. Then you'd step into the unsafe roof and you'd set your two posts no more than uh, less than five foot or five foot less. Then you'd step in by those two posts and set your other two posts. And then you step out into the uh, number two entry in by the intersection and you would uh, set your post or do your roof test, set your post, and then you could travel your team could travel through the middle of the intersection. Okay, let's go over into number three, and you sort of got a diagonal unsafe. And it, it just shows you what the, the roof test is just from rib to rib, in by and out by. However, that would be considered explored, but you couldn't travel through it until you set your post through that area. Okay, uh, Stephanie, if you'll scroll down to just end by the first cross cut, well, scroll up, I guess. Scroll up, just end by the first set of cross cuts. Okay, that's good. If you look at number one entry, you see a uh, unsafe roof coming to a point on the right rib. Of course, you see your roof test there would be just from rib to rib, but the uh, key thing here, if it comes to a point on a rib, that area would be considered explored for ventilation. <clears throat> uh, I think 19, when, when Ron came up and said that would be considered explored. So that's a diagram that shows you what would and what wouldn't. Uh, Stephanie, scroll up to the second cross cut just a little bit. Okay, that's good. All right, well, we're still in number one, and you see uh, sort of a wraparound unsafe roof with a person in it. And it gives you an example here how you could post in from the corner of that. You'd set your two posts on the corner, not uh, at least uh, a maximum five foot apart, no greater than five foot. And then you'd step into the unsafe roof, not exceeding the five foot, and set your other two posts. And if you could uh, get the person at that time, you'd be safe to travel in between those posts and, and get the person. Go okay, into number two entry. If you was, if you was traveling up number two entry and come to another intersection that was unsafe, and you wanted to go to three, first part of it, how would you timber around that corner? Of course, of course, you do your roof test. You set your first post no greater than five foot off the safe rib, out by the unsafe roof. Then you step into the unsafe roof. No farther, no uh, maximum of five foot, set your second post. Then you step outside if you're going to number three and set your second, second post, do your roof test. Then you could travel using that right rib corner, you could travel into the intersection and back over into the cross cut between two and three. If you look right in by and you wanted to, if you're traveling from three to two through the cross cut and you come to the unsafe in the intersection, 
you could go through the intersection using the same method and travel up to. Step over into number three entry, and you got an unsafe roof in the intersection, and you're just wanting to use the rib for support. Of course, you're traveling out by up three, come to the uh, unsafe roof, you do your roof test, set your first post no greater than five foot off the right rib, step into the unsafe roof, set your second post no greater than five foot, and continue through the intersection. Then you step out into the safe roof and do your roof test, do your post. And use the rib line, and you can travel, use the rib line in the post and, and travel up into three. Uh, and with that, I think that was all I was supposed to cover, I believe. Uh, <clears throat> Jerry, was you going to go over the uh, legend? Yeah, I can go over the legend. Okay. Uh, one other thing, if you go to figure seven, page, we don't have a page on it. It's rule 44, and it's talking about systematical expiration. Uh, continued scrolling. Okay, right there, that one. Uh, there was a Q&A on this, how to, if you, uh, say you was traveling up to number one entry, and access up two and three was blocked in your first cross cut, your first team stop, your access to two was blocked. Travel up to the next intersection at team stop two and your access was blocked into two. You go up to the third cross cut, scroll up if you can, Stephanie, just a little bit. Right there, we can use that. Team stop three, and you got an open cross cut, you got to tie across. You tie across into number two at team stop four. And out by, you got to tie out by at this point because it's open. You go to team stop five. Then you got to tie across because it's open to six. Then you come back and you tie out by to team, top, team stop seven. Cross cut between two and three is open, so you got to go to eight. At that time, you'd return back up two, and you tie into team stop nine. Uh, there had been uh, different, the way that rule read, there was uh, different interpretations of it. So uh, to keep this sketch in the rule, we thought it was important for everybody to, uh, to know exactly how you do it. So, Gary, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, Wayne, why don't you go ahead and read 44D there that that, that refers to. And, uh, okay, Stephanie, I will. Stephanie, would you back up to 44D, please? Page 38. Page 38. Okay, you, that's it. Okay, passing or failing to explore an open cross cut. Teams would be required to travel into this opening and tie across into the next intersection. Teams cannot advance from this intersection before tying out by unless the out by entry is blocked. Teams train or teams tying out by when open cross cuts are encountered that haven't been explored, teams must tie across into the into adjacent unexplored areas entries before continuing out by. Teams advancing in by an opening to a point that the number five team member is at or in by the in by rib line will be considered to have passed that opening. If a contaminant is found in an open crosscut, teams would be required to tie across in this crosscut after accessible out by areas have been explored. So that sketch 
gives you an idea of how to tie across and behind. And that's why we did the sketch was because just that way you can follow because following that terminology and stuff and then putting the sketch with it pretty well explains how to do it. And it's a lot easier for the judges too to follow that format of the sketch, you know, when, when you've got that scenario. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, hey, Wayne. Uh -huh. Yes. Can you back up to, to rule 5F? 5F? Yeah. That would be Gary or would that be Will? Might be Will. Will? Let me get back there. Page 12. Page 12, that would be Gary, I believe. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, on 5F, it says if the team fails about halfway through the through the paragraph, it says if the team fails to explore the entire mine, the first point of advance shall be indicated on the maps submitted by the map examiners, except where locations uh, are as follows, the conditions. And it doesn't note uh, cut into old works right there. Does that need to be added? Ronnie, do you have any idea on that? Any suggestions? It's inaccessible now, so does that where, need added? Where did, you, where did you read that? Was that an F? F, yeah. Was that? Let's see here. Let's read that. What paragraph are talking about? Where, where, which sentence? It starts with the third sentence of L. Okay. And I'll go ahead and read it as it is. It says, if a team fails to explore the entire mine, the furthest point of advance shall be indicated on the map submitted to the map examiners, except at locations where the following object, objects or conditions are encountered, such as face, caves, water over knee deep, unsafe roof, across an open, Seals permitted uh, permanent or temporary stoppings, barricades, and inextinguishable fires. And uh, your question was talking about to cut into old works, if that needs to be added in that area? Yes. I think so. Yeah, yeah I think so too. Yeah. Uh, it's just an oversight on our part. Uh, well, if if you don't add it, then they're going to have to put an FBA there, and, and we're saying that it's inaccessible. So, uh, if if or Stephanie, can you add that after any things for fires? What we what we added there on Rule Twenty Four A was cut into old mines, uh, comma cut into abandoned mines, et cetera. Wayne, you, Kevin, and all you guys there. Cutting all works. Or just putting, cutting all works, et cetera, Steph, may be good enough. Thank you. I want to clean that up there and take the and out and move it to between fires and cut there. Hey, when you take care of that, Fix right there. Can you go back to that rule 44 D? And the uh, the sketch you guys had there for exploration. Okay. Let's wait till Stephanie gets there. Usually his. Uh...
Okay, so the question is, what what were you want to go back to the sketch for forty four D? Yeah, I'm reading that rule, and it's you're showing that you went from two, you traveled out by the next cross cut, and then over to three. Team no, team stop number nine on that map was an open cross cut. According to the rule, you have to tie across before you go out by. So why didn't you go to team stop number nine, which is number three, the top end? If it was open. Okay, so you're saying going from team <laughs> four, okay? Forty four D says. You got to look at how you travel. You travel from number one across to number two, okay? Yes. So, therefore, when you get in that intersection and both of them are open, then you have to travel out by before you travel across. Okay, okay. if you go out to team stop number five, then why don't you go to seven before six? Because the rule tells you once you start out by, you got to try, you got to tie across into the cross cuts. So you're traveling, when you start traveling out by, it's just like you're going in by. You're still, as you come to the intersection, you've got an open cross cut to your side. And then you have to tie across before you can go on out by. The reason you go from, when you get over, go from three to four. Now, once you get it, get to team stop four and you check in by and out by, you have to come out by first because you've got to tie out by instead of going across. And once you start coming out by, then you come to open cross cuts. You, you can't pass that cross cut without uh, tying it across then and then continue on, on out by. It's just, uh, you know, what we did was uh, to clear that up is, is to put these steps in order the, uh, yeah. the way, and it all depends on the way that you travel because you're going from one over to two, and then it's open out by you. So before you go across, you got to come out by. Then once you start traveling out by, then you, you're coming to open cross cuts, and it, and it works back away. And that's why we put the sketch there to correlate with that rule. And, and basically, as long as everybody knows how to do it, and that's why the sketch is there. Uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on some of this, but. The idea is we want everybody to know how to, you know, to, to do it the same way and, and, and know how to do it. And it's good for explaining to the judges, too, so the judges don't get concerned. You know, the only rule years ago used to be you got to tie a cross from behind, and really you had an option we could have done it either way. But to clear it up, to make sure in problem designing and everything that were some guy – some team might do it one way, the other do it another one. One might end up hitting a quitter and because they didn't go a certain way. This forces everybody to go the same way and, and enforce the tying it across and behind in the same procedure. If not, you still live in that, that option <laughs> open that out of the problem design, you know, teams might do it different and based on what they find is, is this will affect the working of the problem. This way here, everybody has to do the same thing. Yeah, so what you make the it? key thing is all judges has to judge it the same way. You can't go by your interpretation. You got to use a sketch. So you don't yeah. do a start tying across until you move out by one cross cut. So you make a move out by at least one cross cut, then you start tying across. Yes, four that's by. correct. I got yeah. you. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. The the sketch is much clearer than the than the rule to me. Yes, and it takes the. Judge yes. my call out of it. This is the way you do it. It's just by the way. It's really the, the sketch really clears it up. When I read yes. the rule, it's like I'm back and forth. But that the the sketch is really really helpful. Good job, guys. Thank you, Bob. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Barry. If you don't care, uh, kind of walk through the the ledge in there with us. Okay, on page fifty. Look on page 50, um, you'll see the addition of permanent and temporary in front of the word stopping. That's just to reiterate to the problem designers, if they're putting a stopping, they must say whether it's permanent or, or temporary. And, and the placards that say stopping without stating whether it is a permanent or temporary stopping should not be used. If you look at page uh, on page 52. 
people are talking about smoke. So <clears throat> write out light or dense if indicated on placard. Draw in entire in extent of smoke. And we've added the smoke should not be extended into unexplored areas. I think that was it for as the uh, legend wasn't. Uh, at the bottom of 52, if we could move that test box up a little bit and get uh, what's the top of the next page, 02, right under the PPMCO, would probably help that symbol out quite a bit. All right. Some way, just uh, probably do one space, Stephanie, somewhere if you can find it. <clears throat> Still didn't do it. Hey, while she's doing that, I just since y'all being so receptive to clarifications today, uh, a lot of us have joked for a long time about how you map a live man or a live woman when the plaque when the legend only says live person. Could uh, we maybe include that? Yeah, I'll read the read those two if that's what you, if that's what you're talking about. Um, for as a body. To indicate position of head and feet as the body is found. If the word body is on the placard, show symbol for body to note the additional information that is shown on the placard. It says the orientation is not required for placards that state a body. Uh, for live persons, write out condition indicated on the placard, such as conscious, unconscious, walking, etc. Indicate the position if lying down. Is that what you needed, Chris? Well, no, not exactly. I've heard it said a lot of times. Uh, we see the per placard quite often say live man, and people say technically maybe that should be an X. You know, probably the best thing to do, Chris, would be like to just, just put it uh, live person or, uh, uh, I guess, you know, that's, I guess that's something else. Is just I would, I would just call it a person. That way we don't have to worry for a man, woman, because <laughs> nowadays you get into all this other stuff, LBGT, you know, then you put everything. But, but I guess just I just leave them a person. Yeah, I mean, you can put live minor, live roof bar operator. I mean, you can have a lot of different stuff. So the cleanest thing, this problem designer is to just use live person. Yeah. See, that's all on problem designers. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. It uh and that way you're not it's not confusing because a lot of this stuff and a lot of the work that we did on the rules was uh, kind of trying to clear up some of this stuff that's kind of questionable. But uh uh you know, we spent about a year doing that unified rules and then then we uh we had to jump back here and try to address this up and try to what we tried to do today was mainly go over the stuff that we thought might be questionable because especially the extent of gases is uh quite a bit different going back from the unified rules and uh, we just wanted to hit on some of these high spots plus we wanted to put the briefing officer back in the fresh air base and uh and kind of go over some of that and then dress up the questions uh that we ask and uh you know you get into these hypotheticals boy it can Get into a lot of a lot of stuff, but uh, hopefully, you know, this is kind of putting things up. But uh, looking at statements of fact, we we just left those alone. And uh, you know, what we've always done in the past with the code and the code side was, uh, you know, we tried to pick out things that that uh, teams really need to know, and uh, uh, 
uh, you know, especially based on where uh, a lot of most of the team members uh, work underground every day and stuff and trying to sit and memorize a lot of things that, uh, uh, you know, certain we, what we've done in code, we figured things that teams really need to know to be on the team. And then a lot of the other decisions going to be made from the command center. So, uh, you know, a lot of the minor SB work, as a lot of y'all know, is brute work and things. And, and uh, you know, we just don't want to turn it into where it's uh, uh, all about a class thing and not about real mine rescue. And then, you know, we, we don't want to discourage guys that's going on the ground and work every day that don't have a lot of time to sit and study a lot of, a lot of extras that, uh, it's a probably need, you know, we wouldn't apply to a lot of the stuff, but, but, uh, you know, we, we thought we'd just leave these statements of fact and, and really these last statements of fact, I know y'all know that uh, Danny not passed away. Danny was you know, like a legend in mine rescue and, and really the last Q and A's, I mean, the last statements of facts you really had was, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Danny worked on these and uh, really helped devise this last list that we have. And, uh, and, and it's going to be changed after. Hey, Ronnie. Yeah. And then after this year too, you know, after, after they have the nationals this year, you know, some of these could be subject to change too, but, but trying to get these rules back real quick, like we've had two years within the last month, you know, kind of, jump back and go from the unified rules back to the cold, trying to clarify all the stuff. And, and that's why even today we had to clarify two or three things there because it's easy to overlook because it's, that's a lot of material and uh, trying to get back to, to, to cover it this way. And, uh, and go ahead there. What, what was that last question? Thought somebody asked something there just a second ago. I had a question on rule 35, a little clarification. Page Yeah, so in the in the red lines, uh, the, the exception, full both sides of an airtight barricade. Is that a single structure of the barricade, or would that include a barricade that utilizes two structures? In other words, it, in a in an entry in between intersections, if you had a barricade in part of that intersection, traveled around to the back side of that, and encountered another airtight barricade, can you breach that is without it? ventilating it, or I know you can breach it without airlocking. Is this Hank? Yes. Uh, Hank, it's wrong. Uh, yeah, what that was is like if you make up to a, a barricade, say one side, and you have, say, air spiral, okay, then you, you go around and you end up on the back side and you can come up to the back side of that same airtight structure and make the back side, then there's no, there's no reason, and you want to tear it down to ventilate through. Uh, it's just saying that you can go ahead and tear that down because the conditions are known on the back side, and you, okay, and uh, you know, it's it's the same structure. Okay, so you wouldn't be violating any rules. You're just talking about a single structure, not, not yes, yes, because you know, because you know, you can't breach, can't breach a barricade or something if you got an irresponsible outside when you. Don't know what the conditions are on the other side, you know. That's exactly. So if you right. around and make the back side and say, "Now I want to go ventilate through there." There's, you know, then you don't have to remove that necessarily because you've already made both sides of it, and that's why we just clarified that. Okay. Thank you. That that clears it up. Okay. Thank you, bud. Well, that's uh, yes. This is Harvey Farrell. I see you there, Harvey. You're looking good. Well, thank you, man. I have just a couple of quick questions. One of them is relating to 5F on page 12. 
Yeah, we had so many things that was governed by the uh, questions and answers. If you have an object in an area of elongated, caved, or water over knee deep, is that still an object that would be mapped by the team? No, you can you can't see in water over knee deep for uh, mapping purposes or caved. If you pass it, you know, in unsafe roof, uh, you know, map it, but not. Yes, I understand that. And that also uh, relates to something Kevin was talking about when you enter into an intersection that might have uh, elongated unsafe roof, that the whole intersection would be considered to be mapped for ventilation purposes, right? And, and for mapping. If if the if it's not in caved or unsafe, I mean caved or water over knee deep, yeah, you can map it. Yeah, yes, and he he did not specify that, and I thought it was a little confusing. Oh, okay, all right. It, Harvey, it would be it, it would be things that you'd normally uh, uh, be able to see. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I I understood what you were saying, Kevin, but I thought it was still a little misleading uh, because if it was paved water over knee deep, of course, you would not be able to uh, map those objects. And when, right, we, went right. that, right. we, went up, when we went over that the other day, looking at them, we were trying to address a couple of scenarios that was thrown in the contest uh, on uh, on uh, where that uh, these intersections and uh, throwing that stuff in those odd, odd uh, caved areas, odd unsafe areas, and stuff like that. And uh, but you know, but the rule didn't change for is what you map. You still can't map stuff in water over knee deep or in a caved area. You know? Yeah, I, and, and I understand that, but you, you know, it was that's not in the rules. If if you sit down and look at the rules right now. The, the last thing that I have would relate to the drawing on page 45. And I think Wayne was explaining this. Uh, it's, it's timbering an area that would uh, for team travel. Okay, what's your question, Hart? Okay, as far as ventilation purposes though, if you look at the uh, intersection in number two, the first intersection, once you set those first four timbers, that that intersection would also be could be used for ventilation, and anything that was in front of that also be mapped. Correct? Yeah. Once you step in there, Harvey. You break that imaginary line out by you step the captain steps in there he can see it all in this scenario one you're talking about mm -hmm. it's considered explored by the rule okay that that answers my question and harvey back up on uh, rule 29 you're talking about a minute ago uh the the new uh insertion from the q's and a's in the Next to the last paragraph, it says before advancing into an unexplored intersection, teams will be required to explore all accessible areas at each team stop up to the imaginary line of the next intersection or to an object slash condition to prohibit further travel in that direction. Figure five, this includes initial exploration into all entries from the fresh air base, surface, bottom, and shafts. When the captain enters the intersection, the intersection is considered to be explored unless there are objects or conditions that prohibit the captain from seeing the entire intersection, such as caved areas, water over knee deep, or intact diagonal ventilation structures slash barricades. So that rule does clarify what you was asking just uh, two questions ago. Okay, it does, in fact. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, uh, Harvey. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Kenny here. Okay, guys. Hey, uh, 
really appreciate the questions uh, and the clarification. Say, uh, I think these guys did a heck of a job trying to resurrect the, uh, which what we know is the uh, 2020 rules. So uh, that's what we have. And then again, I'll remind you, there shouldn't should not be any local interpretations once we get done here today. If anybody has any questions after today's meeting that may come up during a local contest or, or what have you, uh, filter those down to the to the committee. You know, we all know who they are. Uh, and uh, we'll get you an answer uh, from the uh, to the committee. Get it out to everybody. Like I say, if, if there's a need, we'll resurrect the set of Q and A's uh, uh, into the season. Uh, we'd we we hope hope we don't have to, but if we do, we do. Uh, leading up to the national, we want everybody to be playing from the same uh, set of rules. Um, so with that, Jeff, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, yeah, once again, I uh, want to thank all our team members that uh, out today. Uh, as you can see, everybody, uh, they've uh, worked extremely hard on these rules. And um, you know, given the small amount of questions, actually, it uh, looks like they did a heck of a job. Um, also, I want to acknowledge uh, you know, people behind the scenes that have uh, worked on this. Uh, um, Stephanie Mead has been working the computer here. She's been... Uh, our uh, uh, keeper of the records and um, you know all, all the different rules and helping uh, Tiffany uh, get it up on the, the website. Tiffany Blair is our webmaster for this. Uh, she also handles the WebEx. Uh, Tiffany's done a tremendous job you know, for this and uh, really appreciate all her help. Uh, also Matt Wright at the Academy and Link South at the Academy. Um, and uh, Tim Watkins, uh, at the um, headquarters has uh, been very instrumental in uh, getting these things uh, uh, into uh, uh, into the, the works today too. So um, with that, um, we've had over 180 uh, participants today. I think that's just a really good turnout. Uh, this afternoon, we're gonna be doing uh, metal, non-metal mine rescue rules. Uh, you can see we, we split uh, mine rescue into both coal and metal as Kenny uh, mentioned today. Um, tomorrow, uh, we're gonna go back to the unified rules for bench first aid and team tech. So uh, tune in tomorrow um, if you're coal and um, you'll be uh, uh, with the bench uh, first aid and team tech, also metal on metal, the same rules uh, for uh, bench team tech and uh, first aid. And with that, uh, appreciate it. And thanks uh, very much. Uh, Get those rosters in to, uh, to Tiffany so we can have a record <clears throat> and appreciate that. Thanks. See you, um, everybody. Be safe. Okay. Everybody be safe. All right. Thanks, everyone. And um, please refer back to your emails or to the MSHA website um, for the links for this afternoon's Metal Non-Metal Mine Rescue meeting. We'll see you later.